Before we get to the insanity, I want to let you know of some upcoming events kicking off in Melbourne next month. The good folks at True Arrow Events are hosting world-renowned philosopher and author Dr. Stephen Hicks for a series of lectures in Melbourne on March 12th, 14th and 16th. These talks will address postmodernism, political correctness and identity politics, and the threat they pose to society and how to fight back. Hicks is a Canadian-American philosopher who teaches at Rockford University, Illinois. He is the director of the Centre for Ethics and Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. He is the senior fellow for the Atlas Society and the author of Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault. Head on over to True Arrow Events website and use the discount code IndependentMan at checkout to receive 25% off the ticket price for all three events. Links in the comments. So, here in Australia, we're about a month away from the kick-off of the Rugby League and AFL seasons, and no doubt if you work in an office, some of the office talk on a Monday morning will involve talking about those sports. Just as you may have heard talk of cricket over the summer. And yes, I know the AFLW has already kicked off this year, but let's face it, nobody gives a shit. Now, perhaps you're not a sports fan and don't engage in these types of conversations. Maybe they even annoy you a little. You may even actively despise the type of people that live vicariously through the achievements of others because their own lives are completely devoid of accomplishments and meaning. But you're an adult, so you tell yourself, let them have this brief moment of joy in their otherwise pointless existence. And besides, by not participating, I can get on with doing the thing I'm being paid to do. Now, I suspect most adults are capable of understanding that not every conversation is about them, includes them, or is of interest to them, and that they are not required to participate. But alas, we should know by now not to equate all women with adults, because you see, it turns out that some women feel left out of such conversations, even if they have no interest in them. Therefore, to assuage the delicate sensibilities of these easily offended bedwetters, we should prevent other people having conversations about things that interests them. Or so says Anne Frank, CEO of the British-based Chartered Management Institute. And no, she doesn't live in a closet. Here she is being interviewed on BBC Radio. Conversations about football, cricket, did you see the game last night, and other sports are part and parcel of the British workplace. But should they be? Do those kinds of conversations actually exclude uh, some people from what's going on? Anne Frank is the Chief Executive of the Chartered Management Institute. She thinks they should be curtailed. And what? why? Well, I have nothing against sports enthusiasts or cricket fans, and that you know that's great. But the issue is, many people aren't cricket fans, so it's more about you as a team leader or um, um, an, a leader of an organization. If you permit that kind of banter, you are excluding people, and your job as a leader is to include them. A lot of women, in particular, feel left out. They don't follow those sports, and they don't like either being forced to talk about them or. Um, not being included in the conversation. So did you catch that? A lot of women feel left out. They don't follow those sports and they don't like either being forced to talk about them or not being included in the conversation. But are those the only two choices? How about not participating and not feeling left out? And in fact, feeling relieved you don't have to participate. I mean, who is forcing you to talk about Manchester United's latest game? I don't know about you, but I don't often feel excluded from conversations and topics that I don't follow. My thoughts are, I have nothing to contribute here, so I'll shut the fuck up and not waste my time talking about shit I have no interest in. Now, while it's hard to take this woman seriously, let's steal man, sorry, steal person her argument here. She did say, if you are a team leader or a leader of an organization... In that case, yeah, you probably don't want to start off every meeting with a 10-minute rundown of last weekend's results. But idle banter in the office around the water cooler or at social functions, do they still have those, is perfectly fine and can be a welcome interlude from the drudgery of cubicle life. And if you're worried that you can't ingratiate yourself to your boss because you're not up to date with the latest Premier League results, then your focus is on the wrong things. Concentrate instead on doing your job well. You know, the thing that you're at work to do. And if your boss is the kind of arsehole that is more likely to give you a promotion because you can discuss your fantasy football selections, then perhaps you want to ask yourself whether you really want to work for such a pack of idiots. But of course, all this talk of sports banner is just the tip of the iceberg. The diarrhea of Anne Frank is about to invoke the slippery slope argument. 
And if I could come to you, we were talking earlier, you said one of the points about this is that football banter can be the gateway to more offensive behaviour, to much more yeah. laddish behaviour. Is that one of the points you're trying to make about it? Absolutely. Um, it's a gateway to uh, more laddish behaviour, and it's a sig- if it just goes unchecked, it's a signal of a more uh, laddish culture, and it's very easy for it to escalate from you know the VAR uh, talk and chat to... Um, slapping each other on the back and talking about their conquests at the weekend. Of course, we can't have that laddish behaviour. Men enjoying themselves in the workplace, or anywhere else for that matter, is a no-no. Now, of course, I don't think it's a good idea to be high-fiving your mates at work about the dirty slapper you picked up on Saturday night. But who is doing that, really? In what workplace is that happening? On an oil rig, miles out to sea, where there are no women to give a shit? Well, Anne Frank does. She's such a self-absorbed authoritarian. She wants to stop people talking about topics even when there's nobody around to get offended by them. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. What horse shit. I see women all the time that clearly have no standards, and I don't accept them. And my point is this, is, is, this shouldn't be banned. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you are a leader of an organisation or of a team... Part of your job as a good leader is to be inclusive and make sure everybody feels comfortable. And I bet if you go around and ask the people who are subjected to this a lot whether or not they feel comfortable or included, they're going to tell you no, they do not. So a couple of points there. She says she doesn't want to ban sports banter, but the outcome of what she wants is the same. She wants people to basically stop talking about it, to self-censor. And this is to come from the leader or boss, which will further reinforce the idea that you should not talk about it. And of course, you don't want to work somewhere that goes out of their way to make you feel uncomfortable. But how far does your boss have to go to make you feel comfortable? I don't like when people talk about the weather. Some people at my work have rain gauges and they talk about how green their gardens are. I don't have a garden or a rain gauge, so I feel excluded. And it's your job as a leader to make me feel comfortable by stopping these conversations. This next part from the BBC host is very revealing. Jackie, that's a good point because I, uh, we've been preparing this item for about a week and I've spoken to lots of people about it. Totally unscientific, but I'd say about a third of them, almost all women, have said yes, they would like some kind of curbs put on football banter. They do find that it does exclude them. Do we need to point out the obvious here? Why do these calls for censorship invariably come from women? Why are women so obsessed with regulating other people's behaviour, especially men? Why does every workplace need to be made over to accommodate the most fragile female? At what point do men collectively say, fuck off? Why am I asking so many rhetorical questions? Well, here's a question for Anne Frank. Do you think that men feel excluded from female-centric topics like fashion or some little knick-knack shop where you can buy pointless shit to annoy your husband? I bet the vast majority of men feel relieved they don't have to participate in such mind-numbingly boring conversations the same way many women feel about sports. But luckily for the Anne Franks of the world, we may not have to rely on our workplace leaders. We could regulate our speech with technology. Could a smart device catch implicit bias in the workplace? Now that doesn't sound Orwellian, does it? Studies have shown that implicit bias, the automatic and often unintentional associations people have in their minds about groups of people, is ubiquitous in the workplace and can hurt not just employees, but also a company's bottom line. And here's our rock-solid evidence. For example, employees who perceive bias are nearly three times as likely to be disengaged at work, and the cost of disengagement to employers isn't cheap to the tune of $450 billion to $550 billion a year. And please don't look into how we calculated those figures because it's all a bunch of bullshit. So employees who perceive bias. So the bias doesn't have to be real. Employees just have to perceive it to be real. Despite the growing adoption of implicit bias training, some in the field of human resources have raised doubts about its effectiveness in improving diversity and inclusion within organisations. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. You know why they've raised concerns? Because implicit bias training doesn't work. What's more, the whole concept of implicit bias is dubious at best. The most widely cited example of implicit bias against women, the famous blind audition study, has now been completely discredited. But let's not dissuade some idiot at Northwestern University from fantasizing that. But what if a smart device similar to the Amazon Alexa could tell you when your boss inadvertently certainly left a female colleague out of an important decision or made her feel that her perspective 
wasn't valued. You know, I'm so sick of hearing about the imagined depression of women. I'd like a smart device to tell me how I could intentionally exclude women. This device doesn't exist yet, but Northeastern Associate Professors Christoph Riedel and Brooke for Co. Wells, shit, if that name doesn't raise red flags, I don't know what would, are preparing to embark on a three-year project that could yield such a gadget. The researchers will be studying from a social science perspective how teams communicate with each other as well as with smart devices while solving problems together. The vision that we have for this project is that you would have a device, maybe something like Amazon Alexa, that sits on the table and observes the human team members while they're working on a problem and supports them in various ways. One of the ways in which we think we can support that team is by ensuring equal inclusion of all team members. But what does equal inclusion of all team members mean? Do you mean everyone has an equal opportunity to contribute? Because I'm all for that. Or do you mean everyone should make an equal contribution? Because if you've ever been in a brainstorming session, you'll know that equal contributions from everyone never happens. Why? Well, because everyone's different. Because some people have something to contribute to certain questions and not to others. Some people have very little to contribute and some a lot. As long as everyone has an equal opportunity to contribute, then there's no problem. But to expect equal contributions from everyone is a utopian fantasy, which is where these people spend most of their time. As a woman, Wells says she knows all too well how it feels to be excluded in a professional setting. When you're having this experience, it's really hard as the woman in the room to intervene and be like, you're not listening to me. Or, I said that and he repeated it and now suddenly we believe it. I really love the idea of building a system that both empowers women with evidence that this is happening so that we can feel validated and also helps us point out opportunities for intervention. What an unbelievably sexist statement. She thinks that little of herself and other women that they can't speak up for themselves. Let's cut the bullshit here. This is a device designed to police language and elevate women's voices because they're so strong and independent they can't do it themselves. I've got a better solution. If women's voices are so oppressed, why not create your own inclusive companies in which you can all make equal contributions? Because according to your own bullshit research, it produces better outcomes. So go on, ladies, put your money where your mouth is. Go out and create these wonderfully inclusive environments. It's a win-win for everyone. You can sit around and celebrate how inclusive you are, and men can celebrate that they are now excluded from your incessant whining about how excluded you feel. As usual, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'll see you next time.